Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a Stanford Research Model SR620, which is a universal time interval counter. It's a really high precision and accurate frequency counter, also capable of measuring time between two individual events, which you can use it from the front panel. Really capable with some really cool features and some unusual ways of displaying data, which if we can fix it, I'll be sure to show you. This thing should have over one gigahertz of bandwidth, and it this and I believe this one does have option one, which is the ovenized crystal oscillator referencing size. So it should be really, really good if you can get it up and running. When I bought this from eBay, the seller said that it does power on and the buttons all work and the display works. So of course what I did, I plugged it in and then a smoke came out of it from the side. So unfortunately either something happened to it in transit or that statement wasn't necessarily true. Nevertheless, we're going to now have to open it before we can do anything else because some of the magic smoke has come up. Let's take a look. And here's a look inside. It's beautiful, very much Stanford research-like design. This is a fairly old instrument actually. And you can see the digital portion over here with the main processor the UV erasable EEPROM over here and then the rest of of course the digital logic as well as the interfaces of the front panel handled right over here. We do have a backup battery, I wonder if that's still alive, but nice to see that I think option one is indeed available on this one. This is Avanized Crystal Oscillator, Stanford Research branded, they make some fantastic Avanized Oscillators, this is definitely going to be good. And we see some delay lines over here as well, which part of the operation, we can investigate and explore that in a little bit. First I have to find out where that smoke came from because overall it doesn't look that bad inside. Something I should point out is that it started smoking as soon as I plugged it in, before I even turned it on. And if I look at this, this is not where the mains is handled. So clearly some part of this is powered as soon as you plug it in, and it makes sense because they probably want to keep the oven hot as well. And some of the other circuitry might still be active. So whatever this is, this is some low voltage switch inside, which explains why it started smoking as soon as I plugged it in. After looking around a little bit, I think I found the culprit, or at least one of them, this resistor is completely charred, so that's probably where the smoke was, and the smoke did come from this side, so that is consistent. We do have something over here, maybe a regulator of some kind, connected to the chassis for heatsink, so this circuitry in the corner here must be all related. So let's go to the schematic and find out what the purpose of this is. This is Q901, and we can evaluate what could have happened. Now luckily we do have a scanned version of this document available for the schematic, so we can go over it. So here's the main line coming in, voltage selection. We do have a transformer over here, which we saw when we opened it up. And this transformer does generate a whole bunch of different voltages, plus and minus seven, plus and minus 20, plus and minus nine, and minus four, unusual little voltage over there. And then that's going to go to the next page. And once I go to the next page, we can discover Q901, here it is. Here's Q901, so what is it actually doing? So we have seven volts coming in from one side, going this way, and then if we continue, we can see that it turns it into 5 volts. So therefore Q901 is in some kind of a voltage regulator configuration. Its base is being driven with another transistor whose base is then driven with this op amp over here. So this is in a quasi Darlington configuration here. So we should have some feedback and in fact we do have feedback coming back into this op amp. And then we need to see where this is coming from. If this is a regulator there has to be some kind of a reference of some type. So it comes over here, goes in here, goes in there. What is that? Up? There you go, it's coming from an LM368, which is a voltage reference generator. Okay, so that all makes sense, which means that this is a voltage regulator. Now there's something else that's a little bit puzzling, is that how has this failed? So the resistor that's completely toast is R901, and the transistor next to it is Q901. So this is burnt up, which means that we do have some short circuit event of some kind over here, but none of the terminals of Q901 are connected to a ground node, and even if Q902 fails or Q901 fails, and if this even fails as a short circuit, what we'll get is that we'll get seven volts onto our five volt regulator, which would probably be an issue. It might you know, kick out and burn some of the logic, but this is an old instrument, so it'll probably survive seven volts. But a short circuit can only happen if somehow there is a ground introduced somewhere. I mean, this could be shorted, I guess, potentially speaking. But there's the other thing is that this is connected to the body of the instrument, and I wonder if that's what has happened, and the failure has happened at that point, causing one of these terminals to be shorter, and that could explain it. So now we have enough knowledge from the schematic to go back and take a look and do some quick measurements. Okay, let's see if our hypothesis is correct here. I'm going to use one terminal of the multimeter to the body of the instrument, which I suppose is ground. So you can see the body is ground, and we will hear that. I'm going to go to this body of this transistor and look at that, that's grounded, that shouldn't be grounded, that should be isolated from the chassis. So if I go to one side of that resistor therefore, yep, I measure zero ohms, there you go. 
and that explains it. So indeed, we do have this transistor shorter to the body. And that could explain it because it could have been happening because of a mechanical problem during shipping. That is at least consistent with what the seller was saying. Maybe it was working before they shipped it. All right, I removed the screw and the nut. And let's see. This is still a short. And here, the short is gone. Look at that. That was the entire problem. Yeah, that's what happened. Something happened during shipping. And actually, if you look at this plastic washer here, let's see if this thing would focus, the plastic washer is broken. And the idea of the plastic washer is that the screw that goes through it is supposed to isolate the screw from the body of that transistor. And that just doesn't happen if that washer is broken. That's really unfortunate. I bet that transistor isn't even bad because there's no reason for that transistor to die. It basically short-circuited its collector. So that resistor had to take the seven volt coming from the transformer all the way to ground. And of course it burned up as a 0.1 ohm resistor. That resistor is unfortunately no longer 0.1 ohm. I tried to measuring across it and it is reading a much, much higher value. <laughs> it's turned into a 500 ohm resistor. Yeah, of course, because it burned up. So we do need to replace that for sure. And here's a replacement. I did not have a through hole 0.1 ohm resistor, so I just converted the precision surface mount one to a through hole. It will work just fine. The transistor was okay. Now bolted down to the chassis. We can try it now. Well, I plugged it in and it didn't catch on fire again, so I think that's a good sign. Let's go ahead and try it out. And uh, look at that. How cool is that? It does come back up and it, it looks like it does have a self test of some kind. There you go. It passed the self test and this clock is running here this light is probably going to take a little bit of time before that turns off i think that's the ocxo that needs to warm up so let it stay up for a minute let's make sure that light actually turns off and there we go the light indeed did turn off so i was just about to go ahead and try and test it to some experiments with it and i noticed that there's something really annoying about the way the thermal design of this instrument actually works and about the way the fan works let me show you there you go so you kind of see that the fan pulsing here there you go, it just turned on a little bit. Now it's going to run like this and then it's going to all of a sudden turn on full blast and then turn off. And the reason for that is that there is a thermistor right behind the fan. And essentially the idea of the thermistor is that the air inside the instrument goes through the fan and it tells the fan how fast it should spin because that's the temperature inside of this instrument it is trying to regulate. Now the holes in the side of the instrument are really small so the airflow is not that great anyway. But the problem with this is that because of the fact that as soon as the fan turns on, the thermistor immediately sees cold air because if the instrument is not warmed up enough. And that means that it will start and stop, start, stop, and it's going to be really annoying for at least five or six minutes before it settles down, and then it will run at very high rates. So what I want to do is I want to remove the fan, get rid of the thermistor, bring it out over here, and put it somewhere on top of the rest of these components. I mean, this is where you really want to regulate the temperature. So I think that would make sense. I'm going to see if I can catch it when it starts and stops so you'll see what I'm talking about. But it's a really unusual place to put that thermistor. And the startup sequencing of the fan is just a little bit unusual and very annoying if you just want to use the instrument for a few minutes. Of course, I understand that you want to leave something like this on for a long time. But for my purposes, I'd rather have the thermistor right here. And here's the view behind the fan where we can see all the elements involved in the fan control. So here's our thermistor right over here, and there's a voltage divider between the thermistor and these resistors over here, which controls the current through this PNP transistor. And this PNP transistor then controls this NPN transistor, which then controls the current in the fan. And that's how they do some kind of speed control. So I want to remove this and bring a wire out and put it in the middle of the instrument. And here is our thermistors here sitting on top of everything else, which is where the majority of the heat is generated. Now, one of the reasons I think this fan had such a bad startup was also because I don't think it's the original one. It's missing one screw down there. And this fan startup sequence with respect to current may be completely different from the previous ones that was having some trouble. But nonetheless, this should address the issue. So the fan startup is certainly better now. So let's take a look at the frequency accuracy of the SR620. At the bottom, I have a rubidium source. This is a frequency counter with a rubidium reference built into it. And it puts out that reference also at the back of the instrument. That's why you're looking at the back of it. And I have this PNC right over here, which we can plug in the front of this instrument. Now, the SR620 also has built-in registers that you can adjust. So if you go through this menu, register 4, this number here is the frequency trimming of the oscillator. It's actually a correction factor that you can enter in there. I filled it around a little bit with it. Both of these units, both the rubidium as well as the SR20 have been on for a couple of hours to really, really stabilize them, make sure they are basically where they settle at. So we can plug this in and see what we get. I'm going to clear this. So I'm taking one second measurements, five of them. So that's a five second update rate. And <laughs> look at that. I mean, that's pretty close to where it's supposed to be. Let's put it on to one second here, so that one measurement at a time here. There's some variation, but it is pretty stable. 
I like to see all the tens there so let's go ahead and I think if you go down it goes up so let's see if we go there you go look at that and we're off by what is it two millihertz yeah 1.8 millihertz which is really really close to where it should be so I'm quite happy with that and it indeed works and it works on the second channel as well now there's two other little things I wanted to show you with this because this is a really capable instrument from many perspectives. It can measure pulse widths, rise times, fall times, differences between events, and it does have a reference that it puts out from over here at 10 kilohertz. And you can use that to measure things like propagation delay of cable lengths or even digital logic. Remember, remember when this thing came out, so it's quite a, quite a long time ago. But it also has a cool feature in the back that I'll show you. So let's take a look at the, how it displays something externally. There, I couldn't resist to tweak it a little bit more. Now we're dealing in the microhertz offsets. Pretty amazing. So let me show you a cool feature of the model SR620. Here at the top, I have a Keysight waveform generator. It is set to 10 megahertz with a 2 megahertz FM carrier, modulating back and forth at a rate of 5 hertz. Essentially, what this means is that the instrument is generating 10 megahertz that goes back and forth 2 megahertz, but really, really slowly. So if I feed that into the SR620, it's going to capture a variety of frequencies during its integration time. So I have set it to integrate 0.01 second, but I've set it to collect 200 samples. So you can see it's updating every two seconds. Now, this doesn't have a very sophisticated display. It only has, of course, this seven segment display here. But at the back of the unit, there is an XY output that you can connect to a traditional oscilloscope, like for example, an analog oscilloscope, and then it would have a display. So you can use an analog oscilloscope as the external display of this. And here with these functions over here, which is called the scope and chart, you can plot things like histogram, means, and jitter as the statistics of this built inside. A really clever idea, essentially when this was designed, it was very difficult to put a big display on an instrument. So this way you just use an oscilloscope. Now I don't have an analog display, which would be most suitable for displaying the data from this, but I'm going to use one of the digital oscilloscopes I have. And here's our setup. I'm connecting channel 1 and channel 2 of the Keysight MXR here to the XY output is directly at the back of the SR620. Now, all the Keysight MXRs, the Infinium software, has a really good XY mode, very sophisticated, and you can manipulate signals quite well. And this is what you get. Look how cool that is. Of course, these lines are going to show up in a digital oscilloscope, but you would have a really nice display in an analog scope. Let's zoom in a little bit more. There's something so satisfying about this. So here is giving us some statistics, for example, the mean frequency is measuring, but it's also showing us the histogram. Now on this x-axis, this is the frequency, of course, and the vertical axis is the number of bins, number of hits at that frequency. Because we have an FM modulation that is being modulated with a sinusoid, we're going to spend a lot of our time at the edges of the frequencies, and that's exactly what we expect. There's even a cursor that I can move around, which is kind of neat. There you go, I can move the cursor over here, and as soon as I put the cursor here, you can see that at a frequency of about 7.8 or 8 megahertz, we have 19 or 20 hits over there. And if I go all the way to the other end, at the ex other extreme of the FM modulation, you see 20. So if I go and change the FM modulation, instead of using a sinusoid, I use a different waveform, for example, a triangular waveform, we're going to have a much more flat histogram because we're spending roughly equal time across all frequencies. And you can see the histogram now flattens out quite a bit. And if I modulate with a square wave, we're going to see two really sharp points, right? Because we spend most of our time either at one frequency or another. And it's really neat that you have something like this built into this instrument. So let's try one other really quick experiment. You can measure the time difference between arriving edges of the two channels, channel A and channel B. So here I'm splitting the reference output of the instrument, which is a one kilohertz signal. I'm connecting it with a short cable to channel A and with a longer cable to channel B. The cable is sitting here at the top. The length difference between these two cables is about 2.7 meters. Now this is an RJ58 cable. An RJ58 cable, you can calculate what the propagation delay difference between these two cables would be, and it's about 13.7 nanosecond. Now if you look at this, it's measuring 0.005 degrees is the difference in the phase between these two arriving signals. At 1 kilohertz, 0.005 degrees is equivalent to 13.8 nanosecond, which is really close to the difference between the length of these two cables, propagation delay. So using this technique, you can actually measure things like the delay that it takes for the pulse to go through one system versus another. Very useful for that kind of characterization. There's a lot more you can do with this, of course, but I thought it would be cool to show this. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this repair and look at this new instrument. There's actually one more Stanford Research Equipment right over there that is in the repair queue that I will hopefully get to next time. As always, thanks to my supporters. You can support the channel through Patreon or through PayPal if you just visit thesignalpath.com or the 
link in the description. You really do make all of these things possible. It gives me the freedom to be able to go and look at for all kinds of different things and do repairs and experiments. There's actually another really cool thing here on the left that I will show you next time as well. Really interesting, totally different kind of instrumentation that I want to talk about the science behind it too. As always, I'll see you in the comment section.